Because I really believe ultimately that relationship is one of the most, oh, how can I say it? Uh, it's one of the best things God gives you, but it's also one of the most trying things God gives you. Because trying to relate can be a real challenge. As a matter of fact, my new book on relationship gumbo, which will come out first of next year, is absolutely phenomenal. And we just finished it, and I'm telling you, I was so impressed with the journey. Because, you know, one of the, I'll give you one of the quick punchlines. The punchline of the book is very simple. It's, it's not your fault, it's not my fault. It's called a guilt-free recipe for managing for love and relationships. And it's not your fault, it's not my fault, it's the gumbo. You heard me do a series on this several years ago. And when you get to a place in your relationship where you can't make it work, you feel you're frustrated, I'm frustrated, then what you have to do is realize it's the gumbo. It's what we mix together, right? Imagine a pot between us, and you put hot sauce in, I put things in, and we taste it, but we don't like it. Now, we like our individual pot of gumbo. When I'm cooking by myself, it feels good to me. Got hot sauce, peppers, hey, man, I'm rolling. But when I blend mine with yours, and now we have to taste it together, for some reason, this don't taste good. Whose fault is it? It's your fault. You put too many peppers in there. Is it really that, is that fair? Could it be it's, it's nobody's fault, no guilt? Could it be it's the gumbo? Not you, it's not me. It's the what? It's the gumbo. So here's what we should do. Dump it. And so I have this great graphic of, of two young people dumping the gumbo. And they're holding the pot. When you get the book, you see they're holding the pot together, dumping it together. Can't dump it by yourself, it's too big. You can't be responsible for all the relationships, it's too much. We gotta do this together. And um, that is the hardest part of a relationship, done dumping stuff. And what's interesting, you can apply this across a very wide range of issues. It could be your job, the same way with people along with neighbors. You ever have a neighbor that's difficult and, and it's just, oh my God, it's just, uh, working with them is just about the lawn or about anything, it can just be a challenge. And so the book is designed to help you deal with people, deal with relationships. So today's message is sort of along that line. It, it takes you down a path where you understand that failure and challenge and building relationship is a part of it. Anything you're gonna ever do well, there's gonna be an element of challenge. You're not gonna always feel successful. Give me an example. This is a quote. I've missed, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times, 26 times, I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Michael Jordan. I don't care how many times you try to be perfect in marriage, you're not going to be. You know this comment is a three-point shot. She's going to get this, and she misses everything you said. You know that he's going to understand after you've made this sacrifice or this investment. You knew. You know. But it didn't work out. But he said these words. But that's why I succeed. Success does not come without failure. It does not come without challenge. It does not come without misunderstanding. And I think if, the longer I'm married, I learn how to develop a lifestyle that will protect it. So what I call this is lifestyle commitments that will protect my relationships. Can you say that with me, please? Come on. Lifestyle commitments that will protect my relationships. There are certain lifestyles you can choose to operate in that will protect any relationship you're in. And I love the way Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, frames them. He's talking to people later on. He'll start talking to married people in chapter 5 in more detail. But he talks to believers at large in Ephesus, and he makes this incredible statement. Here's what he says. As a prisoner for the Lord then, he was in prison, by the way, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've, been, you've received. Key statement. Live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Be completely humble. Listen slow and gentle. Be patient, bearing, bearing with one another in love. There's a bearing in this thing. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. 
I don't think you ever are going to change anything in your life unless you change your lifestyle. It's how you live. It's how you engage issues. It's how you resolve problems. It's how you deal with people. You can marry anybody. You can date anybody. And you will have the same issues. And that's what some of you have learned, because you've gone from relationship to relationship to relationship, and you come up with the same basic formula. Now, I agree with some people, it's a little bit easier. Some things, dealing with Diane, is easy. Some things. And, and I think that's true for anybody. Some things, dealing with some people, it's going to be easy. But I don't care who she is, who he is, who they are. I don't care where they come from. White, black, Asian, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Hispanic, Latina, whatever you call them. Anybody that you date, light skin, dark skin, short, small, big muscles, little muscles, educated or uneducated, there will be some area of difference that you will run into that will not make you happy. Here's why I know that's true. If you look in the mirror, you're not totally happy with yourself. You have <laughs> issue with you. Surely somebody else can have an issue with you. So let's start with that as a premise. Paul says, here's what I want you to do, though. Live worthy of the life you claim to live. Say you're a believer. You say you love Jesus. Live a life worthy of that. Be a person who operates with certain key absolute disciplines. These are things I'm going to do, and he lists them for us. I love the way he just says, let me give you a list of things to do. Number one. He says, I want you to consider being humble. Verse 2, be humble. That means be teachable. There comes to a point in your life, if you're not careful, if you're not lowly in thinking, that doesn't mean that you're without confidence. It simply means you're, just, you're a teachable person. You're somebody that can learn. Are you beyond being taught? Are you beyond being educated? It's so easy to become a person who knows everything. It's so easy. I'm telling you, I fear religious pride. Ooh, I see it. You know, Jesus said some harsher things to religious people than he said to anybody else. Some of you super saved, dedicated, Holy, Holy Ghost filled, five baptized people. Jesus would set you on fire. He called you hypocrites, phonies. He called you all kind of names. He talked about you being wolves. I mean, he, he said, you, you know you can fake behind that hallelujah. And, and he, his, his comments make you think, why would you say that? Because they're not always teachable. Once you graduate to the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. If you're Pentecostal, oh, you got it now. Nobody can tell you anything. Once you feel you felt the Spirit, okay, there you go. That's it. You can't tell them anything. You go home, you act like it. You know, it's sad. This is sad. You come, you come to Jesus, right? Your husband saw you go to church. Your wife saw you go to church. You were nice. You had your beer right next to that beer. The wine bottle right next to their wine bottle. You sipping and talking. I didn't say you're cracked next to their crack. I didn't say that, did I? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But you used to be. Now you got saved. You come home, different person. Mean and yelling. Preaching all the time. I mean, you, you, I mean, you're not, no conversation. See, that's a warning right there. Praise the Lord. That's a warning. My time is up. All right, let's bow our heads as we close. No. <laughs> What's amazing is these technologies are so amazing. Everybody says, wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. This phone giving me all the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> there are times in life you, you, you find that all of a sudden this person has changed. And... You don't know what to do about it. And it's because they've come, become unteachable. Are you like that? You've lost humility. Humility is not a look, it's an attitude. It's a perspective, it's a lifestyle. When I deal with you, I don't come from up here. Even though there is a difference, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There, is a, there, is, there are people at different levels of life. Everybody's not at your place. Some people are past that. They're no longer struggling with paying the bills and not cussing out people and fighting. and They don't do all that. They've been stopped that years ago. You stuck there, but they're not there. Everybody say, be humble. 
Next thing he says, be gentle. Gentleness is interesting. It's a, it's a mild and gentle disposition, being conscient, considerate rather, not harsh or aggressive. Uh, not, it's not a call to be, again, passive, but it's just a person who's in your approach to people, you're humble. You're, you're not, you're not, your you're, you're, you're words. And I find myself, when I get to certain places, that's a challenge for me sometimes especially with those close to me in a marriage. You're, you can be harsher with your spouse than anybody else. You treat your boss better. You would never say that to your boss. You would never say that. You would never behave that way. You're far more gentle in your responses, even to your grandkids, when they, when they mess up. Well, baby, now hold on, baby. Now let's think about what you're doing. Your husband... Man, what's wrong with you, see? Why is that? Why do, you, why do you take that harsh approach with your spouse, your special person, than you do with a child that you're trying to guide? Thirdly, he said, be patient. Verse 2, the word patient is interesting, old King James word, long-suffering. Can you say that with me? Come on. Now, that word just says it all, right? It means this is a long, long time. I've been putting up with this house being messy for a long time. It's long suffering. If you have children, it's long, long, even grown, long suffering. It, it, yeah, and, and that, that don't mean any harm. That don't mean any harm. I mean, um, <laughs> I'm real picky about picking up behind myself at my house, right? All you got to do is have all the grandkids, all the family come over. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You feel, you'll feel like, um, what's that, what'd I say, Diane? Whose daughter? Uh, husband. Um, what's the name? The one who couldn't, they wouldn't let her go to the ball. What's her name? Cinderella husband, yeah. Mm -hmm. You feel like Cinderella husband. If you're not, you know, but that's part of the love. Picking up the toys, dealing with the noise. It's long suffering. And I think you cannot be successful without it. Then he says, be humble, be gentle, be patient. Last thing, be loving. The word he used for loving in verse uh, 2 is the word agape. Now, that word is a profound word when God is des you're describing God's love for you. But, but most of us don't have agape love for people. We have phileo, friendship love. It's conditional. It's tied to some can do. Well, I love you if, but if you do this, if you do that. I, I mean, I just think sometimes we don't realize how we sound. Our lifestyle is not Agape, it's not love without merit. You have to earn my love. You have to earn it. And so if you fail me, it's over. If you fail me, there's no forgiveness. There's no patience. And I just don't think it's possible. I think that you have to be a person who's, who's committed to certain disciplines. And here are three things he says in conclusion that's going to help you. Be mature. Come on, say be mature. Be unified. Be unified. And then, you know, so he kind of jumps back again, be truthful. You, you got to be, be the kind of person who's just mature. This is all about growing up, people. This is not, there's no magic formula. You, you can go to all the marriage conferences you want. You can go to counseling if you want. But here at the end of the day, you're going to have to grow up. You're going to have to say, I can't act that way. I just can't. Now, you can. You can. But you just learn over time it doesn't work. I think sometimes people forget it, but in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, he gives us the job description of the church. And this is, if you want to know where the sin, two verses, Matthew 28, 19 says our mission, okay, go into all the world, preach the gospel, that's our mission. Ephesians 4, 11 says, here's your day-to-day -day job description. Here's what you do. Here's why you gather in church. Here's why you do all the things you do. Here's why we have all this stuff, the cameras, all this is for one reason. To help people mature. 
He gave apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers to prepare or to equip God's people for the work of service. In the King James, it says to equip people to, to, to equip people for ministry. That's the purpose. I am not here to entertain you. I am not here to be a good preacher that you go come to and say, what a great sermon. That was so fabulous. I want you to say that now. I want you to be clear. But that's not my job description. When your kid come home from school, do you want your teacher, kids to say, ooh, the spirit moved in the classroom today. Oh, in math, we just fell out on the floor. We just let the numbers just roll all over us. They said, did you learn anything? No, we just felt God. We felt God. And, you know, I love my teacher. My teacher is a, is a woman of God. I tell you, my teacher is a man of God. I just feel the spirit when I walk by them. I want to honor my teachers. Teachers honors day. It's all about, if you're not careful, the teachers honors day. It's all about the pastors. It's all about the building. Oh, the classroom looks fabulous. Oh, we got, we got new rooms. You don't care about that. Can you add, boy? Can you count? That's the job of the church. You have a responsibility to make sure you grow up. He said he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers so you can be impressed with them, so you can spend your whole life wanting to be them. No. No. Just like he gave principals, right, teachers, counselors, so you can admire them. No. He said to perfect, to prepare the saints for the work of the ministry, to prepare you for the world. That's what it's about. The word equip that's used there is the word that means to cartardizo, to mend the bone. I've said it for years. Our job is to mend the saints, to make you better, to make you mature, to help you grow up. That means I got to push you a little bit. I got to push you. And you need to, if you resist this, if you resist this, it's over. It's over. We're wasting time. You might as well go home and never come back. Because there's absolutely no value. You know, it's so funny. Um, I'm, I'm going to say a name. Not because I, I mean, I've got him. I've not met him. He's, he's, we, we were in a brief relationship. Jim Baker, during the PTL scandal, I got to know him um, through some friends. And um, it was powerful to see that whole season. And, and I, again, I don't want to make it sound like we buddies because we wouldn't. I just got... For a brief season, we were in a relationship, talk a bit and on the phone here and there. But what was powerful was I remember somebody said something about that season. If you weren't here in that time, you don't, you don't know how it felt. But we had Jimmy Swagger's failure morally, and then we had PTL, then we had, we started having this, this list of guys failing, like we've seen recently. There's a list of guys, things just, crap, the whole ministry is falling apart. You know, or Roberts, the ministry in financial trouble. We start seeing all these things happening, right? All these Christian networks going off the air. It was, it was, and, and one, one of my friend's wives, who has, she's in Bahamas, she says something so powerful in that accent. She said, um, she's in the backseat of my car. I never will forget it. And I said, oh, Marlon, I'm, I feel so sad about what's going on. She says, oh, Ricky Dipple, if you don't do what God said with what God gave you, God don't care what they do with it. They can take it and throw it in the trash because it ain't what he gave them. The salt, when it's lost its savior, is worth nothing but trampling underfoot. God will turn this church into a grocery store. They'll ride by here be houses on our property. And you'll say, I remember one day it used to be overcome by faith. Overcome, who's that name? Ricky Hippie Whippy, what was his name? He, what was his name? Because he wouldn't grow up. It's about growing up. Some of you, your biggest issue is growing up. Growing up in your relationship, deciding we're not going to live that way. We're not going to behave that way. We're not going to allow ourselves to go down that rabbit hole. We've done that for how many years? You fight all the time. You fight in the morning. You fight in the night. You find all kinds of stuff. Why are you doing that? You've got to come to a place, he says, of unity. From whom the whole body is joined, verse 16, and held together. That's the point of the whole thing. You mature so that you can unite. You mature so that you grow up. You know, it's hard to look in the mirror and say, you're childish. It's hard to look in the mirror and say, that's just foolishness. It's hard to say, just dump all of that. 
Your mama, my mama, what your daddy did and what your, y'all came to my house, didn't even speak. I was at some Christian's houses. I'm telling the truth. I was there. I was in, I was, it was, it was like a movie. I was in all these believers. I mean, saved, woo, full of Jesus. And, 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 and I saw them, they got, it, one, one said to the other one, oh, she didn't come and didn't speak. And then before you know it, they were swinging. I was shocked. I had, I had, <laughs> I had stepped away uh, to, to, you know, the restroom, and all, all I heard was, <laughs> and so I came. I said, "Oh God, I hope they're not fighting." Diane was out there, and and <laughs> and one of the one of the she got a whiff. It didn't hit her, but the whiff. And that right, baby came by your face. I think she said, "Woo!" I felt it. Woo! She, she, <laughs> I, said, I said, "Oh my God, what's happening to the house of God?" Believers. Everybody said foolishness. foolishness. You didn't speak. You go, what we fight, we fighting. We cussing. You know, you still you still say them words. You you still sound. You still good at that? Why? How, how does that fix what you want to be? You can go to all the marriage workshops you want. You can pay them people all your money for counseling. I think counseling is a good idea. But here's what the bottom line is. You got to change. You got to live a life worthy of your calling. You say you're saved. You say you love Jesus. You got to be truthful. Speaking the truth, verse 15, in love. Till we all, in all things, grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. Now let me kind of get rid of a couple of myths because see when you talk like this people say oh well see you and Diane y'all are special you, you guys are just made for each other you know you are just spiritual people no let me help you all out <laughs> we're different um, Diane and I could be divorced Diane and I could be it, it have issues but there's certain things we decided not to do. So I put some questions down that you might ask me. What causes relationships to not be unified, truthful, and mature? What causes that to happen? What, what is it that stops relationships from getting to that place of maturity? I have one answer for it. You ready? They, they stop climbing. People ask me all the time, how do you stop? How will you marry 43 plus years? How? I adjust it to the climb. First floor. Kiss and hug and second floor. Okay, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, right? Third floor. Now we're on the 43rd floor. Up here, I'm sorry, it ain't all just about the kissing and the hugging and all that. That's, that's nice, right? But, when you, but as time goes on, you don't always have time for all of that. <laughs> you know, you look at your spouse and say, girl, please, I'm tired. See you later. Look, I'm tired. See you in the morning. <laughs> Young person can't understand that, don't he? I ain't gonna never be like that, Pastor Rick. I'm gonna always be ready. Set go. I am never gonna be just. Let me tell you something. Them kids wear you out, man. <laughs> the job wear you out sometimes. You don't know what time it is, man. You be done, you know. You say, okay, I'll be there in just a minute. <laughs> Wake up, it's the next day. You say, what happened? Oh, I don't know. Try it again another day, another day, another day. You have to keep a record because you lose count. Oh, it's been that long. What? <laughs> Get away from me. Some of you don't understand that. Don't worry, keep living. You have to be intentional. And some of you are not intentional enough. I'm going to leave it right there. Some of you don't even try anymore. You've lost all faith, all confidence. Let me move on. Uh, how have you and Diane worked to avoid divorce? Well, one, one where we, we forgive each other and try not to repeat the offenses. So here's number one, we adjust to the climb. First floor, second floor, 10th floor. Okay, we're on 10th floor now, so we're, getting, we're having a little tension. Okay, all right, a little tension. What's going on? Am I getting altitude sickness? Am I getting, I'm just getting, okay, it's intent. Now you up in my business. Now you know I act like I have money, but now you, <laughs> you married me, you find out I don't have the money. You thought I had. <laughs> You know, you ask me about, about my business. You want to be about my business now. See, that's my business. You're my business now. You understand? I'm a man. We get about my business, telling people my business. Well, you broke, you broke. Diane used to get on my last nerve because she quick to tell you, oh, we ain't had no money back then. We was broke. 
I said, Dad, don't tell anybody that. She said, well, we was. We were, we were praying through some difficulties. She'll try to change the words. <laughs> she just say stuff. I just get on my nerves. She'll just say it. Don't, no, no, no. You know, as a brother, you want to hold on a little bit of pride, you know. <laughs> well, women, too. Don't just say men. But th there are moments when I think, as I adjusted to the climb, and we failed each other, we forgave each other. I promise you, I don't care who it is, you, you're going to have to forgive them. I don't care who it is, I don't care where it is, I don't care how. There are moments in life with, in relationship with anybody. Anybody. I don't know why this came to my mind. This is nothing to do with anything. This is not about marriage. Kids, same thing. It's, it's easy, it don't mean any harm. Sometimes, sometimes they do. But that's part of life. Let me leave it alone, move on. Number three, how do you help someone you love be more mature? And that's what some of you are. You, you feel it's your assignment to help them be mature. I'm glad Pastor Ricky's talking about maturity because you need to be mature. That sermon was for you. Turn it up a little louder. You need to hear that part again. Back up the tape. See, you start taking it upon yourself to be the maturer of your spouse or your friend or whoever it is. That's not your job. Here's your job. You ready? Be an example of God's love, a copy of love. And give them time. Give them time. Until loving them is not healthy for you. Sometimes it gets to be dangerous. I admit that. Some of you have been there before. Here's what I try not to be. I try not to be a dangerous person that she loves. Here's my prayer. When Diane prays the prayer, I say it all the time. Lord, prosper me. Lord, bless me. Lord, give me peace. Lord, let me be safe. Don't let the answer to that prayer be get rid of Ricky. One more time. Lord, prosper me. Lord, bless me. Lord, keep me safe. Keep me emotionally stable. In Jesus' name, I pray this prayer. Whatever it takes to make this happen. Don't let the answer to that prayer be, well, he got to get rid of, she got to get rid of him. Or he got to get rid of her. Got to get rid of Ricky. Because Ricky's never going to let her have anything. Ricky's never going to let her do anything. Ricky's going to stop her. You know I'm telling the truth. I'm going to say something I normally wouldn't say. You see my wife do things. You see, I don't bother. Get up and say what she want. You know, I want her to fly. I can, it's, I'm not trying to block her from growing. I'm not trying to stop her from being all God wants her to be. See, I, I don't, I, I, I think sometimes we don't realize what we do to people is we, we, we become the hindrance to them. Don't, don't let it be God said, well, you, you know, he told Israel, he said, you know, you, you got to let the whole generation die first. Think about it. That's what he told him. He said, no, no, you're not going to the promised land with this group. All of them need to die 20 years and under. All of them need, older, I'm sorry, need to die. Don't let that be what's necessary. I pray that she can live. I want to live, Diane. Praise God. I want to live. I want to experience the blessings of God. Anybody say amen if you're hearing me? Amen. Come on, lift your hand. You, you, you hearing me? Come on, you hear what I'm saying to you? Last question. What can I do if someone I love is not truthful? Well, I can't make you be truthful. I can't make you tell the truth. We, we made a covenant on that I ain't following her around. I ain't checking no emails. I ain't checking no phones. Not me. God will show me. And when he shows me, then we'll talk. But once he shows me, I'm not going to spend my whole life trying to make you truthful. I can't make you truthful as a friend. Lover, wife, husband, you can't make anybody be truthful. I've decided in my life I want to tell the truth. And I want to learn how to get past our differences. I want to rise above them and see God's grace. That's part one. Did you learn something today? Amen. Did you learn something? I hope. Let's all stand. Father, we come on this gathering Sunday to sit around the conversation of relationships. We pray that the Holy Spirit would bring blessing and grace, healing and strength to all that we've heard. 
As we leave this part of our study, preparing for part two in just a few minutes, I pray your spirit would bring healing to those who've gathered. May they find the strength to grow up, the strength to rise beyond their differences. You designed this because you believed in it. And so we declare that we believe in it and we're willing to mature and grow. May we understand the reason you put us together. He who finds relationships, finds a wife, the Bible says, finds a good thing. And the Bible says there's nothing greater than having a good friend who will lay down his life for a friend. Help us today, however we apply this to our lives, help us to be committed people in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say this and I'm going to let you go for this part of our service this morning. The average person gets married at 27, 28 years old, they're about. Their marriage is about, they, the average person spends about 20 years married. The average person. So if you beat that, that's good. But the average person. And then the average marriage lasts seven years. They're about. So a lot of times in those 20 years, you've been married two or three times. Most of the time up in there, at least twice. The average wife will outlive her husband and will spend 10 to 15 years without him. Now, there's a lot of reasons why women live longer. Because we don't go to the doctor, don't check ourselves, ignore stuff. There's a whole lot of reasons why. I'm trying to beat that record. Amen. Come on in. I'm trying to beat that record. You hadn't have a physical you can't remember. You're not trying to watch yourself physically. I'm not going to say any more than that. Okay? It can happen to you. You can be a memory. But I want you ladies to see this. 27 years, 10 years, 37 years. You'll spend a lot of time alone. Don't make marriage your life. I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I love my wife. Some of you have forgotten all about you thinking about a marriage. I do funerals. I talk to widows. Some are lost. Because now they are with themselves. It's almost like this week I've talked to two. got to change for yourself. The season you got somebody, celebrate. Stop fighting. You don't have forever. You don't realize this is the season. You fighting over grits and bacon. You, 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 you think you got forever? The fight over this foolishness, you think you got forever? You don't have forever. Let me help you. You don't have forever. In many caskets in this hallway right here. Hundreds. And that final walk, that final walk, I hadn't seen him complain about nothing. Everything seems like foolishness. Everything seemed dump worthy at the funeral. Don't wait to then. Stop it now. Your mama you got for a while, your daddy you got for a while, your family you got for a while, your spouse you got for a while. And you need to pause and hear me today. Because I ain't lying to you. I'm speaking the truth to you in love. So God, we leave with faith and confidence, both in this building and at home. We ask your blessings upon what we've heard today. We leave thanking you for the difference you've made. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all amazing. I love you. Thank you.